All right, good morning everyone and welcome to the OpenMS course. My name is Oliver Kohlbacher. I'm one of the um, developers of OpenMS or founders of this initiative. And the way we're going to do that, you saw that from the program, is that we have a mix of lectures that give you some rough overview of what is really going on under the hood. And then we have hands-on sessions where you can actually work with the software. And Julianus and Timo and I, we are going to walk around and going to help you um, work your way through the tutorial. I think you've all gotten one of these tutorial handouts. Um, I would like to start um, with giving you a quick or not so quick lecture about fundamentals of proteomics and metabolomics so that we are all on the same page. So a quick question for all of you, who has a background in computation? And the rest then wet lab people, <laughs> more or less. Okay. Um, so please bear with me if um, I'm telling you a few things that you might be well aware of if you're working in the lab, um, particularly about the instrumentation. Um, I will tell these things, particularly also to the computation people, because we, we've seen in the past that if you don't know where your data comes from, you don't really understand how to analyze it properly. Um, but please feel free to ask questions if there's something that I don't uh, explain well or just stop me. This is, isn't going to be a one-hour monologue. Um, it's much better if we have some interaction going on. Um, what I'd like to do first is give you some rough introduction to proteomics and metabolomics. This is taken from a lecture that usually takes a whole semester, half a year. Um, you can imagine that I needed to squeeze a few things um, to make that fit into an hour and a half. Um, the key method that we're dealing with is a liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry or LCMS. So I'll give you an overview of that. And then in the second half of this lecture, I will go into the philosophy of OpenMS. Not really the hands-on, we will do that after the coffee break but really what are the key ideas so you understand why it's built that way and why it works the way uh, that it does. So let's start with something that you're probably all familiar with. Um, that's the, the central dogma. And as you can see, that was uh, published by Francis Crick. Um, uh, it's a key idea and it basically describes um, what way information flows. And what he describes is that information is encoded in DNA and it, it is transcribed into RNA, which is, is processed. This is why you have these arrows going here from RNA to RNA. This is uh, mRNA maturation, splicing. And that is then translated into the protein. And usually no information flows the other way. That was the idea. Um, it also means that just knowing the genome or just knowing the transcriptome is not going to give you the full story. As we move down this path going from DNA to RNA to proteins and even one step further to metabolites, we're moving from sort of the blueprint of life more closer to the phenotype, the mo molecules that are actually doing stuff rather than molecules that are just encoding the information on what could be done or should be done. Most of what we are discussing today was enabled by uh, a key event that was in February 2001, um, the uh, first and only time I think that nature and science actually appeared on the same day. Um, and on, on this particular day, they both had the human genome on their cover. Um, some of you might remember that day. Uh, it was a big press conference in the White House. Um, and both journals claim to have the human genome. Um, by now we know that uh, whatever was published back then was only a rough draft. Um, these two drafts were also rather divergent. One was produced by Craig Venter's team at Cedar Genomics, and the other was uh, produced by the Human uh, um, Genome Project. And um, why is that essential for proteomics? Um, well, basically everything we do today um, is founded on, on having the genome and knowing what actually can be out there. And that is also why we talk about post-genomics, 
Uh, we're now going one step beyond that. We're moving in this central dogma, we're moving one step further. We can now look at the transcripts, uh, but we can also look at proteins. And this has given rise to a whole flurry of different ohms. Um, fundamentally, when you think about it, um, omics is mostly used to get grant money. Um, whoever did protein analytics suddenly started doing proteomics. Um, when you look that up in a dictionary, and actually this ohm thing has made it into the Oxford English Dictionary uh, these days, it, it says something like cell biology, molecular biology, forming nouns with a sense all of the specified constituents of a cell considered collectively or in total as plastidome, uh, plastome, vacuum, and so on. So this has been debated quite a bit. Do you actually need that? Um, Nature at, at some point had a statement on their website where they claimed that ever since the rise of genomics, the suffix omics has been added to many fields to denote studies undertaken on a large or genome-wide scale. While not everyone agrees with this change of terms, we felt that the terms are sufficiently widely used to serve as pointers to our published papers in the area. That being said, there are many ohms and you, they shouldn't be taken too seriously. There is actually a web page that collects them. So um, there's an alignment home suddenly. Um, back then, 20 years ago, we just tended to enumerate all possible alignments. If we're done with it, we didn't need a name for it. Um, you can argue whether the animal home is really useful or whether you just call it a zoo. Um, and there are many, many things like that. Um, personally, I. Oh, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, you get all the slides, of course. Um, personally, I'm, I'm part of the anti-ohm, the totality of people who object to propagation of ohms. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. But nevertheless, uh, some of these ohms sort of have withstood the test of time and are being used widely. And when we think about what we're dealing with here, then there are four ohms that are really relevant to what we're doing in this course. That's a genome that encodes... Um, the information, we have the transcriptome that shows us what is currently being transcribed and translated. We have the proteome that tells us what is really there. And we see the metabolome that's telling us what is actually going on at the moment. Why are these postgenomics technologies suddenly popping up everywhere? Why is everyone doing proteomics and genomics and metabolomics and lipidomics and epigenomics and don't know what, uh, glycomics. Uh, everyone is doing that. And the reason is, um, the reason is that we, we can. As usual in science, if we can do something, we just, we're going to do it. Um, and two technologies have driven this development. And that is the development of next generation sequence, or by now we, it's not exactly the next, but yet another generation. Um, that has reduced the sequencing cost drastically. So we can do genomes um, for actually the individual that we're looking at. We can do transcriptomes at very low cost. And on the other hand, um, we have mass spectrometry, high resolution mass spectrometry, usually coupled to chromatography, that enables technologies um, that can look at those biomolecules that um, cannot be replicated by PCR. That's a big difference, and that's a big difference between sequencing and proteomics, metabolomics-driven technologies. We have no PCR for proteins. That means everything we do on this side is quite a bit more complex also on the side of data analysis. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that uh, analyzing genomic data or transcriptomics data is easy. But the complexity of this data is a bit, more, is a bit higher than what we see on the transcriptome level. And that is why we need to work with a larger range of tools to actually make that happen. So who in the room has ever generated their own proteomics or metabolomics data? OK, that's a good mix. Um, I think it would be good if you also, when you talk with other participants in the course, if you pass on that knowledge, um, and you probably get some knowledge on how to analyze this data in return, we'll also have um, time slots tomorrow in the morning and, and, and later in the evening today where um, we can also go over data sets that you might have or might be interested in. We will get back to that later on.
Um, the impact that this has had on data generation is, is, is shown in, in, in this figure here. What you can see is the drop in cost for sequencing one megabase of DNA. And here you see where next generation sequencing really took off. Note that this here is a log scale. So this line here is actually an exponential decay. And this line here is actually indicating Moore's law. So that's uh, the rate at which cost for computation drops, uh, storage, but also computation of the data. And if you see something like this, this is scary. This particular scary for computational people because it means that this is growing a lot faster than exponentially. And that means you can't just get out of this by buying new hardware. So we really need to be able to deal with this amount of data and to see how many orders of magnitude that has dropped in about 15 years. Um, so by now it is dirt cheap and I have people heard argue that we should no longer store genomic data. It would be cheaper to actually delete it once we have looked at it and resequence it. And I, I'm sure we will get to this point. So lots of things have changed. Um, 14 years, 13 years after the human genome was on the nature cover, we actually had this nature cover. And that was in May 2014. Um, it actually presented two papers back to back, two draft versions of the human proteome for various tissues. And that is already the first problem there. Um, proteomes are not as well defined as the genome. I'm not going to go into the detail of what, what changes in genome. Also, different cells in your body have different genomes, but that's a story for some other time. Um, but with proteomes, it, it, it's much more evident that they're highly dynamic, that they're tissue-specific, that they change over time. And these two papers claim to look at uh, a range of different tissues and that they covered about 90% of the proteome. And it, it caused a lot of debate, uh, also in particular whether this number would be accurate. Um, you can argue about that, but you know, it was a first draft, and it actually brought uh, proteomics back onto the cover of nature, which is a good thing for the field on the whole. Um, it also means that now you can go out into a database in the same way that you look up the genome, uh, you can now search for parts of, of the proteome. When we are dealing with this type of omics data, um, or I, I actually prefer to call it high throughput data, um, because that is more um, to the point. Um, when we're dealing with genomics, you know that we deal with DNA sequence data. You get a fast A file or fast, a fast Q file that contains just the sequence. Um, transcripts, um, fundamentally the same nature, but you represent it in, in different ways after you do the analysis. But what should we get out of proteomics, metabolomics, or even interactomics? Well, um, when you think about it, if the proteome is really the sum of all the proteins in a tissue, in a cell, um, then you would just like to know all the concentrations of all the potential proteins. Um, can you see what, what, problem, what, what might be the problem there? It's a very large dynamic range. Very that, is, that is one problem. How many genes do we have in a human? Let's stick with human, in a, in a human genome. How many protein coding genes? Yeah, 20,000 plus minus a few hundred. Uh, the, the, the numbers obviously go up and down depending on whom you sequence and who sequences whom. Um, how about the protein? How large is the proteome? Just throw in numbers. 100,000. 100, Other guesses? Let's just say we ignore all post translation modifications. Let's just say we ignore all degradation products that are truncated. Let's just say we look at everything that has a distinct sequence. 
what you think. Okay. Hundred thousand, sixty thousand. Other guesses? How about ten to the ten? It depends on what you're really looking at, and this is why this, uh, why I'm mentioning this. The definition of a proteome is not so easy. If you include, for example, all antibody sequences in a proteome, then you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, because due to the combinatoric nature of how they're constructed, these are all distinct proteins that have their own sequence, and the space of these sequences is very large. If you ignore immune cells and say, I don't care about antibodies, I just want to know what's going on, uh, then you deal with a different complexity. Now, if you want to factor in all the post-translation modifications, um, then that might be a problem again. Now, so 60,000 is probably a good guess if you assume that experimentally validated are on average between two and three splice forms per gene. So if we take the 20,000 genes, multiply that with a number of uh, like three on splice forms on average, then you get something like 60,000. Um, but as I said, there is, is no real notion. Uh, and, and you can throw in an arbitrary number, and I'm sure you can find an argument for that number. How about the metabolome? 100,000. Other guesses? Hmm? There's no limit. <laughs> Yeah, that's potentially true. <laughs> well, again, it depends on what you count as a metabolome. Um, is that everything that the, the, the proteins that consist, uh, uh, the proteome consists of can synthesize? Or does that also include all the metabolites that are secondary metabolites that are taken up through the food produced by your gut microbiome? Yeah, so it, it, it's not easy and, and sort of the space of potential chemistry is infinite. Uh, so it's not a very well-defined space that we're talking about. Um, all of these different types of data have one thing in common. It's, it's, it's basically reductionist when you think about from in philosophical terms. Yeah, we are trying to look at all the different things that are there. And we're trying to take this machine, this cell apart, and we just have a bill of materials that tells us you have 15 copies of protein A and 20 of protein B and so on. And all these technologies try nothing but list all these things. Um, the problem with this data is it's, it's often quite large. Uh, you have lots of data, and it's also pretty noisy. Um, because if you measure just one protein, the concentration of one protein, and do that with a gel or whatever uh, assay you do, and you do triplicates, you get a pretty accurate estimate. But if you do that for 50,000 proteins or 10,000 proteins in parallel, then you pay for that. There's no free lunch. And in the same way that you get more, you pay for that by getting less accuracy on the individual measurement. So when we compare this classical data, just running a gel or 10, um, with omics data, then we have a much higher throughput, of course. That's the idea with this high throughput data. But we um, also deal with very high dimensionality. We measure many things in parallel, and most people who have not been trained in, in, in bioinformatics and data science and data management struggle with actually managing the data already. Um, we have many projects where the, the amount of data that we're dealing with hits petabytes, and suddenly you run into trouble, like you can't store it on a regular hard disk anymore, and, and things like that that many people are not aware of. In classical data, we have a high accuracy um, because usually every data point is supported by multiple experiments. You do replication, you do uh, calibration, if you do it properly, and, and, and since you are only going after, say, one protein, you just take three weeks to make that happen, but you can't do that for 10,000 proteins. So we have lower accuracy. And it also means that the analysis um, is different. Um, if you just measure one concentration, there's not, not much you need to analyze. You check your experimental error, and you're done with it. But if you have 10,000 measurements, you need to figure out what do I trust? What do I need? And you also run into statistical issues like multiple testing and things like that, that we will not deal with in this course. But as you know, there are other courses uh, in the main institute that will deal with that. Um, who 
knows the book by Dr. Hochstetter Gödel Escherbach. Okay, that's good. This book needs to be known. Um, that's actually from the cover. And I, I like this picture because it illustrates a bit of what is going on when we're doing omics experiments. So what you can see here is, is um, basically two wooden blocks and you shine light at them from different direction. And you see the shadows um, are different along each dimension. Vertically it's a B, this here is in this direction is an E, this is a G. And, 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 and that to me is sort of an illustration of what omics does. Because if you're doing proteomics, then you're just getting one cross section of uh, what's going on in this cell. You get all the concentration of the proteins. But it's not telling you what's going on on the metabolomics level. If you, if you look at another angle at the same cell, say metabolomics or transcriptomics, you can get a very different story. And the magic really of doing multi-omics is putting all these things back together and trying to figure out what is going on. And that is sort of the, the holy grail of this whole systems biology uh, approaches that we're trying to do. So omics is, is a matter of perspective and, and these perspectives have different questions attached to them. When you're doing genomics, then you're only asking the question, what can this cell do? It doesn't tell you that it's actually doing that. It might depend on um, the differentiation state um, that might be also uh, captured in epigenomics later on. Um, transcriptomics is basically telling you which genes are currently turned on. That's one step further. That tells you not just what is there, but what is actually currently active. Um, but that does not mean that these genes are currently really doing anything useful or are actually there in, in, in large quantities. Uh, proteomics tells you which of these enzymes are currently there, which signals are being transduced. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't tell you what the flux through one of these enzymes is. So you need to measure all of these things. And depending on the process that you're looking at, it might be that your question can be found on the transcriptomics level, on the genomics level, on the protein, proteomics levels, or on the metabolomic level, or in the combination of those. So we had a few studies where we were doing uh, systems toxicology, and, and there we basically found that sometimes you fi figure out the mechanisms just by looking at the transcriptome data, but in other cases the transcriptome just says, well, this is oxidative stress. And, and then you need to look at proteomics data or metabolomics data to understand what is really going on. So when we align these different technologies and these uh, ohms, um, we basically see that there are different biomolecules that can be captured on different levels. Uh, with genomics, we're looking at DNA, with transcriptomics at RNA, with proteomics at proteins, and with metabolomics, things are a bit more complicated because small molecules can be many different things. Um, and depending on whom you ask what their focus is, they will have different breakdowns of what they're actually talking about. Some people like to include lipids in uh, metabolomics. Others say, no, that is lipidomics. Um, you can argue about sugars, amino acids. Uh, when are you going from small peptides to proteins? Um, if you have a tripeptide, is that metabolomics or is that proteomics? Yeah, so this is not really a clear-cut story, but this should give you some idea of how it all comes together. When we want to analyze this type of data, what we would really like to do is some sort of integrative analysis that brings it all together. Um, analyzing the individual data set is often trivial if you have a well-founded question. And that is something that is often sort of ignored. People tend to believe, if I do proteomics, it's going to tell me what's going on. Um, nobody would argue, well, if I do a gel, then it's going to tell me what's going on. Uh, so we are sort of stuck in, 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 in a, a bit of a paradigm change. Uh, we used to do hypothesis-driven research. And you ask the question, do I see an increase on, on this protein if I do X to, the, to my system? And nowadays, we have many people that come to us and say, well, uh, I have no clue what's going on. Can't we do proteomics? 
And uh, these fishing expeditions, as I like to call them, um, are a bit dangerous because you don't really know what you're going to find and oftentimes you don't find anything and then people are disappointed. Yeah, I spent 20k on this bloody experiment and still I don't know anything. Proteomics is useless. Um, it's, it's not like that really. Um, but oftentimes we need to uh, ask the proper questions and then we need to think where might the answer to that question be hidden. And sometimes it can be hidden in, say, uh, metabolomics data, sometimes it's going to be hidden in interactomics and proteomics data, sometimes it's going to be on the regulatory level and we need to look at the transcriptome to actually figure out what's going on. And if we have really no clue, if we really need to start a fishing expedition, then we might as well start this fi fishing expedition at all levels and try to figure out how to bring it all together. The problem with this is um, if you do that and if you do that right, it costs still a lot of money a lot of time and also lot, lots of expertise and, and most people are able to deal with one type of omics data, they are good at analyzing proteomics data, but then they're probably not the experts on genomics or on metabolomics. And that means we need to uh, have an interdisciplinary team also that uh, analyze these data and um, the complexity of these questions is often uh, underestimated. Um, if we really try to do systems biology, where we look at different levels, try to integrate it, then uh, we also need a, uh, we need a computer. We need computational systems biology. We need people that look at the data, analyze it, and integrate it. Now, where I'm going with that, um, integrating this data is tricky for multiple reasons. Um, who has ever worked with more than one omics type in the same experiment? Okay, that's good. What what were those omics types? Can you just okay? Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, good. Glycomics also. Okay, any other ohms that we missed? No. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, so the first thing is already the, the integration of the data. I mean, when you do large-scale data, you often end up with several terabytes of data easily. Um, and what are you going to do with it? You will not be able to integrate it at the level of the raw data. So you need to do some processing. And you need to do some semantic integration. Semantic integration means we need to map things onto each other. That can be done by IDs, but IDs are often not enough. Um, also, they are ambiguous in, in, in many ways. There are many issues there. We often deal with different data formats. We deal with different communities. The transcriptomics community doesn't care about the formats of, of the proteomics community and vice versa. Proteomics and metabolomics have been talking to each other every now and then, but still there's, there's a disconnect there. Um, but also we have a, lock, lo a lack of data, and that has to do with the fact that in particular proteomics and metabolomics, we, if we're honest, we're only measuring the tip of the iceberg. Uh, remember my discussion about the size of the proteome. The proteome is really large, and if you've analyzed the proteomics data uh, experiment, and with metabolomics it's even worse, um, we really get only a fraction of what, what is probably there. Um, you have, we will get back to that later on. We have issues with um, sensitivity of these methods, but also um, issues with really identifying things, in particular with metabolomics. We often see there is something, but we have no clue what it is, and that happens in proteomics as well, and in all the other omics is even more. Then we have different scales. Um, measuring the proteome, metabolome, transcriptome at the same time is not so easy. Oftentimes, the extraction of these, um, of these different types of biomolecules in parallel is uh, hard because it requires really well-established SOPs to actually get everything out of that, get it processed real quick. Um, we also have different uh, length scales uh, and also time scales. Uh, how long does it take to turn on uh, a gene? Hours? Uh, not always. Can be done in, in minutes, yeah? and then that's also what you expect for protein translation, but metabolic reactions are much faster. 
uh, they happen on a time scale of, of 10 to the minus, don't know, 12 seconds, 13, 10 to the minus 13. Um, so much of what we really see on, on the proteome level on, and transcriptome level is disconnected from what we see at the metabolome level. Um, and you need to bring that together when you analyze it. So let's start talking about um, proteomics uh, a bit at first. So the term really means the study of a proteome, as we discussed earlier. Um, we've discussed a bit whether there is something like a proteome, and we, we can have different opinions. For the purpose of, 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 of this course, I would define a proteome as basically whatever is in that tube at one given point. Yeah? You extract it from your cells, and those are the proteins that are in. That's what you care about. You don't care about whether there is something like the abstract proteome. Um, whatever you have in the sample that is made of amino acids, you want to know what it, what it is. Um, so it's usually from one tissue, it's usually from one organism, from one cell, from one time point. Um, proteomics tries to do two different things with such a sample. Um, initially, um, it was enough to just say, what is really in my sample? So we tried to qualitatively analyze uh, sort of again a, a bill of materials um, what is in this sample and that means just a list of proteins um, but of course you're also interested in how much of these proteins in, is in there and that is actually a much harder question um, because you can do that absolutely so you want to have a concentration like number of copies per cell or you want to have something like 10 to the minus 7 uh, uh, mole per milliliter or something like that, some absolute concentration. But more often, since that is very hard to achieve, you're asking a question, what is going on differentially? So if I have two proteomes, what are the differences between them? Usually that is a much more meaningful question and also much easier to get, as we will see. And, and I'll show you the reasons why that is. Um, the problem here is that the concentrations in the sample vary drastically. There's a very large dynamic range uh, that's required. And, and you can see that here on the right. Um, that's basically um, the, um, the uh, number of counts. And, and, and it actually covers um, there are different numbers on that. But people have claimed that the dynamic range of a proteome should be at least 10 to, the, to 11 orders of magnitude. Um, you can believe that, or you can argue it might be two or three orders more or less, depending on the case. But it is something that is very hard to achieve with any analytical technique. Most analytical techniques, if you've ever thought about the notion of a dynamic range, will not be able to deal with 10 orders of magnitude for, for various reasons. We will look at that in a minute. So when we're talking proteins, um, and please bear with me if I go really back to the basics, but I really want to have the terms straight, particularly also for the people that have uh, a computation background. Uh, when I talk about a protein, I, I'm just talking about a polypeptide, a linear chain of amino acids that usually have a three-dimensional structure. But for the purpose of, of proteomics, we usually don't care about this particular structure. We only care about the primary structure, which is the sequence of these amino acids in, in the protein. Now, these proteins um, consist of amino acids, so the sequence is usually defined as the sequence of these amino acids read from the N-terminus to the C-terminus. And these amino acids have an amino group and carboxylate group, and a condensation reaction forms the peptide bond that connects them. Yeah, so that is really kindergarten biochemistry. Um, but it needs to be said because it, it lays the foundation of why we can actually analyze uh, proteins using mass spectrometry. So when we are doing proteomics, we usually have a couple of questions that we try to address. And the first one is protein identity. If you read such an amino acid sequence, if somebody gives you like five to ten amino acids, um, then you're often able to identify the protein that this sequence came from. So do you have an idea of how many amino acids do you need to have a unique uh, unique sequence or uniquely identify the protein in, in say, a human protein? Seven. Seven. Why is that... Why is that so? Why seven? Someone told you. Um, 
there are actually two answers to that. So seven is, is about right. You can argue whether it's seven or, or eight or, or nine, but there is a computational answer, and there is actually a biological answer to that. Have you any idea what... I mean, the, the computational answer is pretty clear. You just look at the whole proteome, and you count what is the expected value that have it for this sequence. And then you come up about uh, uh, seven or so. Um, what's the biological answer to that question? You all know that the answer to this question. You just haven't thought about it. That is the statistical answer, but not the biological one. How does the immune system recognize foreign proteins and self proteins? Well, the, the length of an epitope is somewhere between 7 and 10. T cell epitopes are 75% of them are of length 9. So if that works well, then obviously having a length uh, 9 peptide seems to be reasonably well. Uh, or it seems to be capable of distinguishing self from foreign. Yeah. That gives you some hint that uh, having that length is sufficient. Um, you can also ask other questions. You can ask uh, for splice variants. Um, a gene can rise to different mRNAs, uh, give rise to different mRNAs and different proteins. Oftentimes, these splice variants have different biological functions. And it is not so easy um, to figure that out. Um, we will see what the problem with splice variants is later on. We also would like to see polymorphisms. People do that right now, mostly at the gene level. We try to sequence the genome, and we believe that whatever shows up there, we will also see on the protein level. Um, that is not always true. Um, we have post-translation modifications. Um, PDMs are better, very heterogeneous and, and significantly alter the function of the protein. If you don't know them, but if you know that your protein has post translation modifications, then that might be a proteomics question as well. Um, you've all seen something like that. Um, proteome, that's sort of the, the, the standard example, the caterpillar, uh, pupa, and, 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 and the uh, butterfly. They have the same genome, um, but obviously they look very differently, and then people claim, well, this is uh, because of the proteome. There's more than that going on, but it's, it's a nice example. Um, but there are other questions where it's evident that transcriptomics is not going to cut it. Um, I pulled out one example um, just because, to me, that was sort of an eye-opener when we wrote that paper or started working on this problem. Um, we tried to understand what uh, platelets are doing. Platelets are non-nucleated cells. So obviously, doing transcriptomics is not going to help you anything because there are no transcripts in that bloody thing. Yeah. So the activation of platelets is driven through proteins and, and signaling on the protein level only. And if you want to understand that, then the only thing that you can do is really PTM uh, analysis on the proteome level. And we did that, and, and we found that there are quite a few um, uh, trans, uh, 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 phosphorylation sites that change over time, and if you understand of how they're doing that, in what order they're doing that, then you get some insights on the signaling that's required to actually activate platelets. All right, um, metabolomics. When we're talking about metabolomics, then we are talking about small molecules for the most part. Um, they intermediary. Uh, and intermediate uh, and products of metabolic processes, basically everything that biochemistry can create. So the space is huge. Um, it's not just limited to what is being produced by the organism itself. We take up food with plenty of secondary plant metabolites. Uh, we, take, we have a microbiome that drastically modulates the metabolome and, and that is actually required for us. Um, and, of course, we have other chemicals, drugs that are being taken up. They're all small molecules. They're all in the body. You can show them. Uh, you can eat them. Every one of us has caffeine in, in, in their bloodstream, or most of us at least. And that is also something that is part of this metabolome. So it's chemically much more diverse, um, and that gives us lots of trouble because when you try to identify, and we will talk about identification in, in more depth later on, when you identify something that consists only of 20 amino acids, 
and all you need is a sequence of those, then that is a lot easier than identifying arbitrary chemical molecules of a certain size. Um, when we bring it all together, um, metabolomics or metabonomics, you might uh, see both in the, in, in the, in the literature, um, has quite a few applications where you would want to know all these molecules that are present. Um, you can think of personalized healthcare. Everyone is very excited about clinical metabolomics. And that is pretty clear why that needs to, why that is so exciting, because it's really close to the phenotype. It's also very cheap. You can easily generate uh, a thousand patient urine samples and do metabolomics on that. And then, of course, you have to hope for the best um, that you find something. Um, we're back at this fishing expedition, but there are many questions that where we have already a pretty good idea that we can find that on a metabolome level um, that has to do with uh, nutrition, lifestyle, but also patient stratification, if you want to know whether a patient um, can be treated with a specific drug, that is something we can look at. Um, we can also look at metabolome-wide associations. In the same way that we look at what gene is associated with certain disease, we can also look uh, at metabolites, we can identify biomarkers, and biomarkers on the metabolite level are much more convenient than biomarkers on the genome level, uh, for various reasons. Chemometrics um, is uh, basically statistics for chemists. Um, chemometrics uh, deals with analyzing chemical data uh, in a statistically valid manner. So they have been looking at quantitative structure activity relationships and, and things like that. Um, metabolomics and proteomics also come together. And this is sort of a, an example that you all know. Um, that's a metabolic network taken from CAG, from a database, and if you look closely, you recognize your textbook biochemistry. Uh, this is a, the citrate cycle. You see citrate here, cisaconitate, isocitrate, oxalosuccinate, CO2 goes out, so you know this citrate cycle, even if, if it's not really obviously a cycle. Now, in this map, you see two things. Um, you see these uh, circles here that are labeled with names like citrate, cisaconitate, isocitrate. Those are the metabolites. And what are those boxes? Yeah, they're the enzymes um, that are converting, uh, catalyzing specific reactions. So this is actually what we measure with proteomics. And this is what we measure with metabolomics. And now you see how it all fits together. There is a different um, perspective on that. Um, what is fluxomics? The rate at which yeah. So basically, fluxomics gives you not just the concentration, but it actually gives you the gradient, the first derivative of this concentration. And that is essential because that is much more closely related to these protein concentrations, um, because it basically gives you the rates. And, and the concentration of the proteins, again, is rate limiting for many of these steps. Um, so by bringing that together, you get a pretty accurate picture of what is going on. But you actually need to have both in order to understand it in, in more detail. All right, questions on that part so far. Um, I hope I could give you some idea of how, what the big picture is and, and how it all dovetails uh, when, you, when you're looking at this type of data. Um, I would then like to go one, one level further down and, and really look at the data and, and look at how it's being produced. Um, and the technologies that we are really dealing with, um, there are many other technologies. You can do proteomics with arrays, you can do metabolomics with NMR and so on. But what we focus on in this course is really driven by chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. Well, if you've been to a lab where uh, proteomics and metabolomics is being done, you've seen something like this. You see an LC. Um, uh, we will look into this thing in, in a minute. And you see another box here that's usually adjacent to that. Um, that's the mass spectrometer. And fundamentally, um, these two instruments do uh, rather similar things. Um, they try to separate molecules, and they try to count them in some way or analyze their quantities. So chromatography is something that goes uh, back a long way. It was uh, uh, established in the 1800s uh, as a separation method. Um, in our case, we separate proteins or peptides or metabolites. We will look into that in a minute. 
And the key purpose is really reducing the complexity of the samples. Because if we're dealing with 100,000 metabolites or with 50,000 proteins or whatever we have in our sample, then we will not be able to measure them at the same time. We need to sort of spread them out over time to measure them, and that is what LC does. Mass spectrometry then is used to identify the biomolecules um, either in terms of a fingerprint, um, again, we will look into that uh, more closely in a minute, but also to quantify them because the detector of a mass uh, spectrometer is, is very sensitive and has a very good linear range. Let's start with proteomics. Proteomics these days is usually done um, using so-called shotgun proteomics approaches. Um, the name is inspired by what people did in genomics. Um, you know that you can't really sequence a genome. All you can do is sequence tiny bits of DNA. Um, depending on the technology, with Illumina, for example, you have 100 to, to 250 bases that you can sequence in one go, and then you have to start from scratch again. So the original idea was you just shred the whole genome, you sequence these guys, and then you put them back together. Uh, sounds simple, not so straightforward in, in many cases. You also know that now we have other sequencing te technologies, long read sequencing, that can go a lot further than that. But that's uh, the key approach, and that's what you do in proteomics as well. So we extract all these proteins, and then we digest them. That means we cut them into smaller pieces, peptides. We can do a fractionation, say, through isoelectric fo focusing. That gives us some pre-sorting of these. Um, and then we do HPLC. Um, we go into the mass spectrometer and what comes out, and that is really all the data we ever get um, are just mass spectra. So what is mass spectrometry really? Um, so if I would define it, I would say it's an analytical technique identifying type and amount of analytes present in the sample by measuring abundance and mass to charge ratio of analyte ions in the gas phase. Now there are some keywords here that are essential. The first thing is all a mass spectrometer ever does is measuring the mass to charge ratio, not the mass. Yeah? Uh, it, it should be called a mass to charge spectrometer, but that is sort of inconvenient. Um, the other thing is um, it happens in the gas phase, and that is also important to keep in mind. Yeah? You cannot really just inject your stuff into a mass spectrometer, it's, it's not that straightforward. Um, we will abbreviate that as MS, but you know that um, it can basically cover a wide range of analytes as long as they can be charged. And that is sort of the other essential thing that is in there. It goes back to a uh, few developments, actually uh, quite a long time ago. Wilhelm Wien was the first guy to separate different charged particles with ma magnetic and electrostatic fields. That was in 1899. You might have heard of Sir Joseph Thomson, um, uh, very famous even a unit uh, that was used in mass spectrometry named after him. Um, he improved on these uh, techniques and then sector, mass, uh, spe sector field mass spectrometers were used for separating uh, uh, uranium isotopes in the Manhattan Project. Um, so it has um, applications beyond that. Mass spectrometers have been sent to Mars. Uh, to analyze things there. Uh, you see them at every airport. They have really been around for a long time. It's a very versatile technology. And only um, later it was actually uh, used for biomolecules. So it had been in, in the chemistry labs for really a long, long time. Um, but it required a few other developments to make it aminal for, for biomolecules. So what's really in a mass spectrometer? It's actually, a really when you think about it, it's a really straightforward thing. Ultimately, um, you have a sample, and this sample needs to be turned into a spectrum. Um, that's very, very high level, I, I, I admit that. It has basically three components, um, and you will find them in all these mass spectrometers. One is an ion source that takes this sample and turns it into a charged particle in the vacuum. The second is a mass analyzer that really determines the mass to charge ratio, and the third bit is a detector. Now, some of these things can sort of converge. You can argue what is mass analyzer, what is, what is detector in some cases. Uh, it's not so uh, straightforward anymore. But the idea is you take these peptides or metabolites, you somehow attach a, char a charge to it. Um, why do you need the charge? 
to move it. Well, it could actually it can fly without the charge, but you have no way to make it fly in the right direction. Yeah, the charge is really needed to have control over these ions using electrostatic or magnetic fields um, to accelerate it into this mass analyzer and basically to to know where it's going. And uh, that is why all the uncharged particles. I mean, you can make them fly, of course, you can just evaporate them. Yeah, but uh, you will not be able to record them. Uh, you will not be able to control this. This mass analyzer, uh, when you think about it, it basically sorts these ions in some way, typically by mass to charge ratio. And then the detector, in the simplest way, would just count them. And there are different designs of mass spectrometers that do that in parallel, that do that one after the other. Um, I will not go into that uh, in too much detail. But that's ultimately everything this mass spectrometer does. So if we feed it a sample, this is what it will do. It will sort it, it will count it, and out comes a signal. By combining liquid chromatography with mass spectrometry, um, we can use mass spec as a very sensitive detector, much more sensitive than mother, uh, many other techniques. Um, it can easily detect hundreds of compounds, metabolized peptides. It can be coupled to HPLC, then it's called HPLC MS. Um, and the idea is that the analytes come off the column at different times, and then you can record them in the mass spec um, at, at each of these times. Now, a little, little bit of, of physics. Um, as I said, we need these charges to accelerate these ions. Um, acceleration is usually done by electrostatic or magnetic fields. Um, it's the same idea that we have in gel electrophoresis as well. You know, you apply the voltage and then they migrate in the gel. Uh, <coughs> it's actually much easier to do in vacuum because you don't have the gel. Um, but the fundamental idea is the same, and you know from, from uh, physics that that's the so-called Lorentz force um, that is applied if you have a charged particle, a charge Q, and you have an electrostatic field or magnetic field um, and the velocity at which this particle travels, then you can compute the force and then you just apply Newtonian physics and you basically figure out where it goes. It's, it, it, it's that straightforward. Um, if you know Newton's second law of motion, you know that this force somehow relates to the mass and to the acceleration. So if you apply the same electromagnetic field, then you can determine the acceleration of this particle if you know it's mass to charge ratio. And you see that is where the mass to charge ratio comes in. Yes, please. Is well, this is actually why. Yeah, because the all you can do is take this particle and accelerate it. And if if the mass is twice as high, then it'll be slower. Yeah? But you can compensate for that by having more charge. So if you cannot control how much charge is on the individual molecule, you have no way of actually knowing whether it's so fast because it has so much charge or whether it's so fast because it's so light. So, so when you're charging it initially, that's definitely going to be a problem. Yeah. You, you can't tell how much charge it is actually Yeah. Is, is there some law that... Well, that? there is a distribution of that. And, and you try to keep it in a certain range but you have no way of really knowing that for the individual molecule before, before you have measured it. It depends on the ionization. I mean, you, in some cases you try to ionize them. If you do MALDI, for example, you usually get plus, uh, plus one ions, but not always. And there are also benefits for having higher charges on these molecules uh, because they tend to fragment more easily and things like that. But fundamentally, this instrument is unable to measure that by design distinguish between mass, uh, mass to charge ratio um, that are equivalent. Or you can just tell that. Yep. yep. That is one way to measure it. So if, because if you know the acceleration, I mean, the, the, the simplest way to actually do that is, is apply uh, an electrostatic field, um, basically a voltage, and these ions uh, enter from this ion source. And if you apply the same electrostatic field to all of these ions, then you will get different, different accelerations because if the mass is twice as high, um, then you see that the acceleration for the same field, for the same charge, uh, will be just half of what you get uh, for the lighter ion. So if it's light, it flies quickly. I mean, it's very straightforward. When you kick 
a cannonball, it won't fly as quickly as when you kick a basketball. Uh, that, that's the fundamental idea. Um, you can determine the time of flight. That is one way to do it. Uh, but there are also by now many other uh, mass analyzer designs um, that, that can be used. There are also different masses, and it's, it's sort of essential to keep these different masses apart. Um, they have been defined by the by UPAC, the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry, and I would like to sort of disentangle these, these terms a bit um, so that we, we know what we're talking about. So first of all, atoms and, 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 and thus also molecules have a mass, that's pretty clear. Um, but they don't have the same mass, you know, that they're isotopes. So these are basically atoms that differ in the number of neutrons in the nucleus, but not the number of protons. So they're the same element, but they have different mass. Um, these masses are generally given in units of kilogram, that's the standard unit. Uh, however, there are different conventions when we're talking about atomic and molecular masses that have been laid down. Um, the atomic mass is also dependent on, on, the, on the speed, so we're talking about the ground state uh, uh, rest mass. Um, we express this in, in unified atomic mass units, um, which corresponds to one twelfth of the weight of, of the carbon uh, 12 uh, isotope, so it's 1.66 and so on times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms. That's what we're talking about. Um, now there's quite a bit of confusion with different units. Um, um, the Dalton DA, that is a non-SI unit, which is, is used and, and usually used equivalent, equivalently with the unified atomic mass, but not always. Um, there's also this unit Thompson that I mentioned earlier. What is the Thompson? Has everyone ever run across one Thompson? Well, that was the unit that was used for mass-to-charge ratio. Uh, so a Thompson is a Dalton per elementary charge. Um, and in, in many journals you can still find um, uh, the AMU, um, the atomic mass unit, um, that's roughly the same. But you know, they differ in sort of, in, in the fine details. Uh, after the third digit they tend to deviate. So you need to be a bit careful. Now what are the masses that we can measure in these units? Well, one is the accurate mass. And that is an experimentally determined mass. The exact mass sounds very similar, but that is not an experimentally determined mass. That is the theoretical mass. So if you know the composition of the molecule, you can compute the exact mass. And the difference between accurate mass and exact mass of a molecule, that is your mass error. Uh, and, and you need to keep those two things apart. When somebody tells you an accurate mass, that is something they measured. When they tell you the exact mass, that is something they computed. Um, you can also compute the molecular weight or the relative molecular mass. Um, that's a ratio of the mass and the unified mass unit. That's when you say this has a weight of 525.4 uh, Dalton. Um, and for ions, you have to be careful um, you have masses that come from additional protons or from losing electrons or adding electrons depending on how you do it and that needs to be factored into this mass as well. Uh, note that these terms are not used as accurately I, as I introduced them. I mean you can look them up and the IUPAC has actually a very nice document on that how to do that. There are actually papers on how to actually use this nomenclature um, but um, if you just Google stuff together and if you go into papers that are 10, 20 years old, you will find them used in very different ways and you can often not really figure out what, what it is exactly. Okay, um, back to the isotopes. Um, isotopes are atom species of the same element that have different masses, so far so easy. Um, for proteomics, we deal with only a bunch of, of, of um, atoms that are really relevant. Um, C-H-O-N-S-P, that's what you uh, need to make up proteins, even phosphorylated ones, that's where the P comes in. Um, and you see that um, when you're looking at hydrogens, uh, well, we have only 0.15% of, of deuterium in naturally occurring hydrogen on average. With carbon, it's different. We have 1% C13, nitrogen um, only 0.4%. Um, Tricky is, is sulfur, 
because here we have 4% of, of S34, which is actually two Dalton heavier um, than, uh, than uh, 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 the other isotope, the, the most frequent isotope. Um, what happens if you have these molecules made out? So well, every atom, of course, has its own mass. So it's either C12 or C13. But if you have a peptide that has 100 atoms, what would you expect? Well, you would expect that 99 of them are light carbon atoms and one is heavy. It's not that simple, but you get the idea. That's what you should expect. And as you go to longer peptides, your odds that having all light carbons are pretty small. Um, we need to um, look into those numbers when we try to determine the mass of a molecule. And you can do that um, by just summing up um, protons and neutrons. You can look at the nominal mass and the exact mass. Um, and this is where it becomes a bit complicated because the exact masses are, again, based on accurate masses. Why is that? Because someone had to measure the mass of these guys eventually. That is usually done. Um, and, and note it down, and then you have the, the exact mass uh, for one atom, and, and you can basically add them up. Now, with the nominal mass, we, we, we lose all the digits beyond the decimal point. So we would just say, well, hydrogen is 1, and uh, carbon is 12. So if we look at this composition here, glycine, C, uh, C2H5, NO2, we have 2 times 12, 5 times 1, 40 times 1 and 60 times 2, so all in all 75. But if you work with all these uh, exact masses that have been determined for the elements, then you have to work with 8 to 9 digits be, be, uh, behind the decimal point. And you can compute either the mass of the lightest variant with all the light isotopes, or can, you can also compute the masses that are higher. What happens if we have one heavy carbon atom in there? And if we are talking about this uh, sort of the... the um, so-called monoisotopic mass, then we're actually summing up the weights of not the lightest, but the most common elements. And that is something that's often forgotten. Do you know an element where that makes a difference? Obviously, when you look at this here, the light versions are always the one with the highest abundance. Yeah? Hydrogen, carbon, and so on. So if you want to compute the monoisotopic mass of something that contains hydro hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, you will just add up the lightest version of that. But there are some elements that play a role in metabolomics, like bromine, where that is not the case. And there you need to be careful. Yeah, so it's really not defined as the lightest. It's defined as the most common. Um, then you can um, also determine the, the mass defect. That's the difference between the mass number and the monoisotopic. And you can compute that. Um, it's, a, it's an exercise that I leave to you. You can just work your way through that. And you can also determine the average mass. That is what you can look up in a periodic table. You just determine how many percent of that, what would you expect on average. OK. Why is that getting interesting? Because we want to look at um, experimentally determined masses. And we want to also determine elemental formulas in, in, in metabolomics. And for that, we need to know what to expect. Um, these masses, in particular the accurate masses uh, that are measured, they come with an error, and that error can be uh, absolute, but it can also be a relative error. Usually it's a relative error, and you've all heard, if you work with the data, heard of PPMs, parts per million. That is usually how we specify this error, and that also gives you some idea that mass is something that a mass spectrometer can measure really, really well. So you don't give this error in percent, as you would do like in photometry, yeah? but you give it in ppm, and even, even often you have less than one ppm. So this thing is extremely accurate in, in, in measuring masses. All right, um, so much for these UPAC terms. Um, I leave them in the slide so we can look them up. There are also references in there. I think that's useful because oftentimes people are not really aware of the differences between these things. But let's, let's get back to isotope patterns because that is what we care about most. Let's assume we have a molecule with one carbon atom. Then we have only two possibilities. We have a light variant or a heavy variant. And 99% of all these atoms will be light. 
and in 1% of the cases they will be heavy. Um, what does that mean if we go to longer molecules? Well, we have to compute something like isotope patterns. If we go from one carbon atom to a molecule that has 10 carbon atoms, then of course the lightest variant still contains only C12, um, and that's a monoisotopic uh, variant, but others contain between 1 and 10 C13 atoms. And you can compute the probabilities of that. It's, a, it's what's called a binomial distribution, and that gives rise to patterns um, like this, where we see that there is not just one peak that's caused by the same molecule, same peptide, but we have multiple peaks. We have the monoisotopic version, that's the lightest version, and then we have adjacent peaks that are caused by exactly the same molecule, but with different isotopic variants in there. And these isotope patterns can be computed, and they uh, change with mass. So what you see in this table here is um, the isotope distribution for the monoisotopic, k equals 0, plus 1, k equals 1, so that is sort of 1 neutron more, um, up to 4, for different masses of the peptide, 1,000 Dalton, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. And I, I show you what, what these patterns are, look like. So for, for lighter, smaller, shorter peptides, we have this pattern here, where the monoisotopic has always the highest intensity, and the others sort of fall off. But as you go to a longer peptide, it becomes less and less likely that you have all light atoms in there. Uh, for a peptide of um, 4,000 Dalton, the chances for any individual peptide molecule that it has only light carbon atoms is 9%. So the majority of these guys will have a higher mass than a monoisotopic mass. And if you increase this, um, this binomial distribution approximates a normal distribution. Uh, so it shifts a lot to the right. And that is also one way, when you look in the data, to recognize what is light, what is heavy. Um, there are ways to compute that. There's, for example, an online calculator where you can just put in the mass or can put in the composition. It's going to compute this isotopic distribution. Um, there are also a few caveats that um, when you go to very high-resolution instruments or small molecular weights, then you start seeing a, a so-called isotopic fine structure because um, carbon and nitrogen, while they differ by one neutron, actually have a different mass. Why is that? Yeah, that's the mass defect that you have heard of. Uh, this mass defect means that you can actually pull them apart. Um, it's basically the, the, the energy loss that comes from forming this nucleus. Um, so you need to be aware of this. This, this here is sort of the, the core structure that you always see, but if you zoom into that in very high resolution instrument, you start seeing this fine structure, isotope fine structure. Um, it's actually multiple binomial distributions that are convoluted, but here it gets really um, a bit complicated. If you want to compute that, um, then this is how you go about it. Um, if, you're, if you're given a chemical element, H or N, um, you can compute the probability of the natural abundance. Um, these uh, intensities are given by these pi E's from 0 through, through K. Um, and you can see that this here is a really straightforward way to compute it. You just need to multiply all of these combinations, and that gives you this binomial distribution. Um, it's a convolution, and if we know this convolution operator, um, we can do that in a straightforward manner, even for multiple isotopes. But this I only show you. I can, I, I'd be happy to go into that, but for most practical purposes, it's sufficient that you can actually compute it in a straightforward manner, uh, and you know, you need to know what it looks like. Looks like. All right, that was two de force of, of proteomics and metabolomics in, in, in 60 minutes. Um, what I would like to do now is give you some idea of, of OpenMS and NIME, um, which you probably haven't worked with a lot. Um, let's start with um, something that you might have seen in, in this or another form. That is the growth of omics data repositories at the European Bioinformatics Institute. So from 2004 to 2016, and you have different li colored lines for different types of experiments, different repositories. This here is basically genomics, 
um, this year is microarrays, this year is proteomics, and that year is metabolomics. And, and these dashed lines, again, are exponential growth. That's Moore's law. And now you can start thinking about what is the EBI scared of most. Well, it's the stuff that is growing really, really quickly. Uh, that crosses these lines of Moore's law. You see here, genomics, they're not really scared. The data is growing exponentially, but it's growing at the same rate as, as hard disks get cheaper. Uh, so you, if you renew every five years, that's, that's perfectly fine. You can deal with this exponential growth. But if you have things that are sort of coming up uh, real quick from below that are growing more than exponentially, then you're in, in trouble. And you can see that um, proteomics data, metabolomics data, they have been coming late. The post-genomics technology is also in this way. Um, but the data that we have is growing very rapidly. And that has to do with the fact that many people are now trying to do multi-omics approaches. And there the data sets are huge, they're heterogeneous, and people try to integrate them. Now, if the data is growing so quickly, that means we also have to deal with more data per experiment. And that has to do with the fact that the instrument resolution has also grown a lot. So the typical data size that you get out of a, meta of, out of a proteomics, metabolomics experiment is also growing exponentially. And people have been arguing that this is going to be a problem. You might have seen some of these uh, uh, articles, people are talking about big data, how big data is going to change the way we, we do science. I, I don't buy that, but that's a different story. Um, we're dealing with big data, and big data can be different types. It can be just volume, but it can also be heterogeneity. It can be um, um, the, the, growth, the rate, at, uh, rate of growth. And the problem really is that if you, if you do that, and, and if you deal with terabytes of data, it's actually very hard to do that manually anymore. And people have recognized that you might have followed this debate about reproducible science. Um, we're facing a bit of an issue there because many of the things that are being published cannot be reproduced in a straightforward manner. Um, and that is not surprising because many of us, um, many people at least who were trained like 20 years ago, uh, were not facing big data. They never learned how to deal with big data. They never learned what the, the problems really are. And now that we're facing high throughput proteomics metabolomics, um, people quickly figure out that um, analyzing one sample is not a big deal. Uh, if you're dealing with 20, yeah, then you need some patience. But if you're dealing with a couple hundred or even thousands of samples, then you have problems that you have never faced before uh, when you were doing one sample only. So high throughput experiments require high throughput analysis. And you can solve that by just hiring more postdocs. Um, but you will quickly see that uh, postdocs don't scale as well as computers. <laughs> also, computers are easier to get than postdocs, at least good ones. So we really need to think, start thinking about how to automate this analysis. And that is very hard for some people. And I, I know some really great mass spectrometrists who really want to see every spectrum. And they don't believe it until they've seen this spectrum and, and they've looked at every peak. And at some point, you just have to let go. Uh, because if you're dealing with 100 million spectra, you will just not be able to look at every single one of them. At some point, you have to start believing in statistics and in automated processing. And that is where workflows and pipelines come in. Now, if you look up what, what is a pipeline, um, of course, you, you know that you can transport oil, but that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, when you look into a dictionary, um, you will find um, different definitions. And one here is the one that applies. In computing, it's a linear sequence of specialized modules used for pipelining, which is in itself, at least for a dictionary, uh, reasonably circular. Uh, as a definition, but there you go. Um, the, the key term here really is, is linear. Um, this is related to workflow, which is a sequence of industrial, administrative, or other processes through which a piece of work passes from initi initiation to completion. Note that here it, it's not necessarily linear. So workflow is a more general concept. It can be branched. It can have types of loops in there. Um, and, and but oftentimes, people use them interchangeably, and it's the same thing. It's a data processing pipeline or data processing workflow, which means in goes the data, out comes data. <laughs> but you would hope, um, in co and, and that's the big 
difference to these oil pipelines, you would hope that less data comes out than goes in. So it's basically about reducing data. It's, get, it, it's about getting rid of 99.999% of the data and just extracting what you really care about. And as bioinformatician, I'm often dealing with collaborators that, that come to me and say, this is the data and you, the bioinformatician, make sense of it. Um, well, first of all, it, if that happens, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off because they should have asked me a year before they started doing the analysis. <laughs> And also because they believe that I have this like magic pipeline and there's this button that I hit and then mm -hmm. out comes supplementary material too that they can just <laughs> attach to their nature paper and, and that's of course not the way it works. Um, it is much easier if, if you start designing the data analysis the moment you start designing the experiment. And oftentimes uh, they come to me and tell me, well, here's a hard disk and tell them, well, there's a trash can. Yeah? That's where your hard disk belongs because there's nothing you can analyze with this type of data. The experiment was designed in the wrong way. Or I can guarantee you that with this sample size, you cannot see anything that's, that's going to be meaningful. So it, it's really essential that you start working with these labs from scratch and design data analysis and experiment in parallel. And that was the idea when we started designing OpenMS. And OpenMS, uh, as you will work it, use it in this hands-on, uh, goes hand-in-hand -hand with NIME. Um, we started with something with tools that you can use to design workflows. And NIME is the so-called workflow engine that then executes these tools in the right order. Uh, this linear sequence that you heard of. And that's what we're going to use in this hands-on session. It's a graphical thing. You don't need to write code. You just drag and drop things, and it all sort of fits together and works nicely in ideal case. And that is because OpenMS, uh, ultimately, it's just code to write code. It's just a C++ library at its heart. But these algorithms have been wrapped up into small tools that you might know from Unix operating systems, for example. They're small tools that do one specific task and only this task. So we have like Lego building blocks that you can put together in the right order in order to be flexible enough to deal with your experiments. Because in proteomics and even more so in metabolomics, there's not one experiment. You can do lots of different things. And if your data analysis pipeline is not flexible enough, then you cannot uh, model this whole experiment. Um, these tools can then be put together as workflows in different workflow systems. And what we will use is, is NIME that I'll introduce in a minute. So we have different tools, and these tools are not sort of black boxes. You can always look into them. You see all the parameters. You can even look at the code if you care about something like that. Um, but, they're, but they're also not monolithic. There's not one GUI. There's not one, uh, one standard way of doing things. And that's sort of the biggest drawback. of you, you cannot have both. You either get flexibility, then things can be complicated or you get simplicity and then you're not flexible enough and you can't deal with many with many of your experiments. So we're trying to do some get some balance there. Um, why, why do Lego building blocks actually work so well together? The reason is that they have standardized sizes for these knobs and holes and um, they're basically the clue of these building blocks, and the same is true for OpenMS. We're using standardized formats, and that's mostly the formats designed by the uh, PSI, the Proteomic Standards Initiative. So you can read up on that. It was re published. Uh, we have a couple papers on it. The, the last one was in Nature Methods 2016, where you um, get some idea. It's 185 distinct tools in version 2.0 utilities for extracting information, but also tools for protein identification, protein quantification, metabolite quantification, metabolite identification, and then various other things. And you don't need to know all 185 of them. Um, but we will work our way through some of them, some sample example ap applications in these three days. And at the end, you should know at least 30 of them and have some idea of what, what 30 others might do. Each of these tools is rather straightforward. Um, there's not much code in there. They're very short bits and pieces. Those of you who like to program, uh, we can also look into these tools. Uh, for the rest, we will skip that. But at the heart, these, these tools are very straightforward to write because they have standardized input-output interfaces. We have a library underneath that has algorithms and data structures that can deal with the data. So oftentimes, these tools are not very complicated. Inputs and outputs are 
essential to be in a standardized format um, because if you don't have standards, um, then you will have a hard time making things work together. And that is what we see in proteomics a lot. Many of these tools write out the results in a different format, read things in different formats, and as long as you move in this OpenMS ecosystem, there at least all the bits and pieces fit together. If you try to integrate other tools, and if that's what you want to do, we can also discuss that. There are ways to do it as well. Things become more complicated because you have to sort of write clue code or just make adapters to make things match. Um, what are these formats? Well, the key format for storing mass spectra is MZML. Uh, that's a successor of, of, of MZ data and just stores spectra. Um, but there are a couple other standard formats, and these are open formats. These are not the vendor formats. Um, and, and I will not start ranting about vendor formats. Uh, uh, well, I might, but uh, not right now. Um, these standardized formats can hold different information. MZ Ident ML, for example, is used to store identification, uh, Tremel for inclusion lists and transition lists, Quant ML for quantification, and MZ Tab, that's a uh, a tabular format where you can report basically everything from identifications to quantification and that's you can open that with Excel, you can open that with R to do statistics on that. We will talk about that as well. Now these, these formats have some advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of course it's open so even in 10 years and if you don't no longer have a license for the vendor software you can still read them. That's a, an advantage at least in my book. Um, they work with different software packages but of course they have also disadvantages you need to convert the vendor formats into them, and the vendors make that sometimes easier, sometimes not so easy, uh, for, for various reasons. Um, and they tend to be a bit larger, so you can get larger file sizes, which might be a problem as well. The tools themselves um, have a documentation, and during the course you will learn to look at this documentation, read it. Um, so here the feature finder, for example, has some tools that go before it, go after it, you scroll down, you get some information on the parameters that you should choose. Uh, you get some information of what the algorithm really does, perhaps a link to the paper where this has been published. And you have like 185 of these pages that tell you how that goes. Um, but here we will, of course, in the hands-on, we will guide you through that because we have prepared a couple of standard workflows that illustrate how it's done. Um, building these workflows from scratch, if you have never done it, is not so straightforward, but it's kind of easy to use in a best practice workflow, and we have them on our web page for some application and modify them. Yes, please. Can anything Yes. Um, with some, it's easier. With others, not so much. But fundamentally, yes. As long as it's a mass spectrum, we can store it in MZML. And all the big vendors, of course, have a conversion tools. And there are also open source tools for that. Okay. Um, I will just say a few words about uh, NIME. This here is sort of that's the graphical user interface that we will use not for, um, um, for um, um, looking at the spectra, but for just building these workflows. You see these, these uh, squares here. These are the nodes, as they call them. Um, they're basically the tools. And they're connected by these edges. That is where the data flows. So you can think of that as a representation of how the data flows through. Um, NIME is a tool that was actually developed for, for CAM informatics, um, but is now being used by over half of the, of the Fortune 500 companies for financial reporting as well. Yeah, because it doesn't really matter what data flows through, it is very flexible. You can actually analyze uh, financial data in the same way you can analyze mass spec data. Um, the nice thing why we like uh, NIME is that it has all these built in visualization capabilities. So it's a data science platform you can analyze that you can actually highlight things in one plot and you immediately see them in the other plot and, and this is a much more powerful tool than um, say Excel to, to analyze the data and you will see it's not so easy to get into it but once you started with it you will I think you will like it and uh, you will have another tool available to actually analyze large-scale data. All right I stop here um, after the coffee break we can then get started with the handouts and work our way through that. Um, and then in the afternoon, I'll give you two shorter talks where I give some background again on the methods that we're going to use. Um, but for now, we're going to start working with some aspect data. <laughs>